So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this discussion, Way for Ways Forward, COVID-19 and Indian Agriculture. Now, COVID-19 has brought into the forefront and into stark relief many long-standing systemic issues, challenges that progressive people's movements, researchers, academics, and journalists have repeatedly raised and cautioned the public and policymakers about. Now, these, in, you know, key among these are the abysmal conditions of our public health and public welfare services and infrastructure. Um, then the absence of appropriate, timely, and sufficient social protections for the precariat, that vast proportion of India's population on whose labor our homes, daily comforts, houses, cities, transportation, food, sanitation, healthcare, commerce, and numerous other facilities depend. As India went into a sudden and unprepared lockdown, it is these workers who faced its brutality. Um, another key issue that has been forefronted is the issue of hunger, which has been created by the inability and or unwillingness of the government to use its food stocks to feed stranded workers and urban and rural poor. There are reports in the press, um, mainstream and alternative, of uh, large stocks of food grain being wasted in the godowns of the Food Corporation of India. Because the central government has not expanded the coverage of schemes such as the public distribution system. So in a country with sufficient food reserves, potentially, people are going hungry. Now that lockdowns are being lifted and the COVID-19 discourse is moving to the what next questions, um, we are also moving, going to devote this uh, webinar to those questions. We have Professor Madhura Swaminathan, who is a development economist and professor. She's the head of the economic analysis unit of the Indian Statistical Institute. She's a founding trustee of the Foundation for Agrarian Studies. Our second speaker is Ranjini Basu, who is a policy researcher with focus on the global south. She works from Focus's India office in New Delhi. So with that, I am honored and privileged to invite Madhura Swaminathan to please take the floor. Madhura, please. I am going to speak on uh, the impact of lockdown on agriculture. And right at the beginning, I would like to say that although agriculture is less than 15% of our gross domestic product, it, there are 69% of Indians living in rural India, all of whom depend in some way on agriculture. So the adverse impact on agriculture is not only that sector of the GDP that is affected, but hundreds of millions of livelihoods in rural India. Now, when we come to the impact of the lockdown and associated uh, disruption in uh, economic activity, in uh, transport and communication, uh, I think it's useful to separate the effect on the crop sector from the other allied sectors. So let me start with crop production. March, April, uh, is the time of the rabi harvest in India, which is made uh, wheat in Punjab, Haryana, parts of Madhya Pradesh, Uttar Pradesh, some boro paddy, rice in Bengal, and some sugarcane, maize in some other parts of India. So in the irrigated parts of India, it was a time of harvest. And except for the first few days or the first week of disruption, the harvest activity did continue and was completed. The real impact in the case of the crop production sector is on prices or what happened to sale of the harvest produce. And this is where a huge adverse impact came in. Uh, Professor R. Ramkumar of the Tata Institute of Social Sciences has done a very detailed uh, study of market arrivals in the case of 16 commodities. And he looked at mid-March to mid-May of 2020 and compared it to the same period, March 15th, to May 15th of 19. And for every commodity, there's a huge decline in market arrivals. Fewer markets or Mondays were functioning. When they started functioning, there were restrictions on timings 
on the number of people who could come for selling, on the quantities that could be brought in, on the number of trucks, and you know, so many other things that are part of the agricultural supply chain. And the question then is what impact this had on prices. Uh, the first, and I think uh, impact that everybody agrees on is huge price volatility. So much more fluctuation in prices on a day-to-day -day basis and steep price fall for several commodities, particularly perishable items like fruit and vegetable. Uh, there are some ex exceptions here and we should mention them in Punjab where the wheat harvest was coming in, the well-established system of public procurement at the minimum support price and that more or less went on track. Another exception here is Kerala, where rice harvest was coming in, in in central Kerala, Trishur district and other places. And the government of Kerala's supply co uh, organization, uh, parasitical organization, which offered a higher MSP than the central MSP, 26 rupees to 18, also organized procurement organized arrangements for harvest, for machinery, for transport of the produce uh, to the procurement centers. So there were a few exceptions, but in large part, the producers in India were left to the mercy of markets, which were not functioning uh, as a result of the lockdown and suffered price reductions and therefore income reductions. The other, the non-crop sector, uh, in fact, has taken an even larger toll, perhaps, uh, which has not yet been documented fully. Uh, again, I'm going to look at uh, Ram Kumar's paper, which is forthcoming in the Review of Agrarian Studies, a journal of the FAS, and also a document uh, prepared by the Kerala government on the economic impact by the State Planning Board. And whether it is milk, whether it's poultry, whether it's meat, fish, flowers, there have been huge losses, economic losses. Let me just give an example. The demand for milk declined by about 20 to 25% in the lockdown. And this had an impact on milk sales and milk prices. Just today, the Karnataka Milk Cooperative Federation has reduced the price of purchase for the second time since the lockdown. And of course, private dairies had reduced it much earlier. India is the second largest beef exporter in the world and our exports collapsed. And as all of you know, in the, in, in the case of beef and uh, mutton and so on, there are many cases where interstate travel, uh, transport of uh, animals is very important and this collapsed, abattoirs in Mumbai closed and that affected uh, uh, sellers in many other districts of Maharashtra as well as in other states and so on. Uh, fisheries. Uh, this has, again, the uh, decline in fisheries because except for very small fishermen, fisheries uh, on the large scale was not allowed. And the lockdown came exactly one month before the two-month ban from mid-April to, mid, uh, to the end of May uh, on fisheries that applies to all the marine fisheries in India. Uh, so just before the ban came in, they had a month of lockdown, which is usually the period of very high fish production and huge losses, for example, uh, to fishermen because of sale, of exports, of retail, of processing, and so on. Poultry. Many of you would have heard uh, about a Karnataka farmer who buried 6,000 birds alive on one day. So small producers, medium producers, larger producers, when they could not sell milk, some of them stopped feeding their animals as much. The flowers lay on the fields. They were not even harvested as floriculturists could not sell their produce. Uh, so chicken and eggs were either uh, buried or destroyed as there were no markets, there were no transport networks, there were bottlenecks. So this disruption of the supply chain has affected milk, fruit, vegetables, perishables, like eggs and poultry, which have a certain fixed lifetime, perhaps much more in terms of incomes than the crop production sector. Uh, so 
The first point that I wanted to make is that when we look at the agricultural sector, there's been an impact on production, particularly for non-field crops. There's been a huge impact on prices, price reductions, price volatility. At the same time, when urban retail prices went up, but today we're talking about rural households and as producers and consumers, not so much uh, at urban uh, consumers, uh, as a result of which the incomes, there's been a huge income loss. Now, the, I can go into details of this uh, now, or if there, are, if there are questions about specific sectors, but I would like to say a little bit now on the differentiated impact of this. So the whole agricultural economy was adversely affected, uh, but what was the effect on different classes in the rural economy? And this is a question for which you need field level data and the Foundation for Agrarian Studies uh, did a small rapid survey in 16 villages across 10 states, uh, calling respondents whom we had already interviewed over the last year, several years, and finding, about, finding out about the impact. And I think uh, without any, uh, I can generalize very easily here that the large landowners, the capitalist farmers, the rich farmers were not as badly affected or were minimally affected as compared to the small landowners and the poor peasants. And let me give you a few examples of this. Uh, in a village in West Bengal, uh, where the potato harvest had just been completed before uh, the COVID lockdown, so it had been completed in the early part of March, a poor farmer who was a tenant household uh, had sold part of his potato crop at 600 rupees per bag, which a bag is usually 50 kilogram, but the remaining which he had to sell after the lockdown, uh, the price fell to 500 rupees. So it, one sixth reduction from 600 to 500 per bag. Now in the same village, a much larger capitalist farmer said he was able to store the produce in cold storage and would sell it later in the year. Of course, if lockdown affects prices in October, September, October, November, uh, that family too will be affected. But as of now, you can see the clear uh, differentiated effect. Uh, this price reduction uh, in the case of vegetables, in the case of uh, uh, sericulture, in the case of various produce is because the small peasant does not have the resources to keep the harvest, to store it, to sell it at a later date. Uh, today, this small cultivator, the poor peasant, the middle peasant is also heavily indebted. And this brings me to the third point, which is what next? What about the next season, the Kharif season, which is about to begin since the monsoon has arrived in India. The poor peasant who, here a very important point to note, which has come out of the village studies that the foundation has done over the years, is that a large number, almost all poor peasants and middle peasants, if they are dependent heavily on income from wage labor and from income as manual workers as well. So in this season, and we will hear about it from the next, se the next speaker, when employment collapsed, this has also affected the incomes of poor peasants who depend on a significant share of their income comes from wage labor. And this is something that we have identified as a very important phenomenon in large parts of rural India today. So this poor peasant who already is very low levels of income, now his, his crop or her crop might have been affected. The prices at which they sold it have, might have collapsed, has had no additional income from wage labor. 
how is this cultivator household going to take up agriculture in the next season? Whether it is a field crop or whether it is poultry farming, how is this small cultivator going to take up? And this is where I, it's very uh, sad to see that there are no clear support systems in place. The support that, has, that needs to be announced by the government of India is to ensure that the supply chain in terms of availability of seed, of fertilizer, of credit, all at reasonable prices, is there now in time for the small peasant to take up the next agricultural cycle. Because in a way, agriculture is something which because the Kharif season has started, can be the first stage of revival of the Indian economy, but only if the large majority of small farmers are given adequate support. And what do we have? What are the announcements that have come? What is the support that has come for tenant farmers, for purposes, for small landholders? Almost nothing. There are changes in laws. The APMC Act, the uh, uh, Marketing Act is going to be changed. Even if this is to have any effect, it's not going to have any effect till the marketing season starts after September, October. And many states have already enacted changes to the APMC, so this is nothing new. Similarly, the Essential Commodities Act, run, which is not going to give those resources to the resource poor cultivator today. Uh, new MSPs have been announced, but as a long article shows, these minimum subsidies are a very small increase over last year. And in many states like Karnataka, for the majority of crops, the price exceeds the cost of cultivation, if at all, by a few handful of rupees. In terms of credit, which is very important at this stage, the only thing that has been announced is a delay or a moratorium on repayment. So the loans taken last year, the repayment date has been delayed, first for three months and then it was extended again for another three months. Uh, welcome, step, but what is going to be the resource this month in June to start production, to buy good quality seed, to buy fertilizer, to hire machinery for land preparation, and so on. So I can go into uh, these uh, steps later. Uh, I think, uh, I didn't look at the time when we started, but I think I've done my first round. I'll come back again later, uh, but let me uh, to summarize the, the impact on agriculture. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madhura. In fact, uh, you do have a couple of minutes more if you'd like to make any other point. In a sense, we expect agriculture to be least affected by the lockdown uh, because the rural part of India was less affected because we know the COVID pandemic, uh, the large centers, uh, clusters are in urban agglomerations. Also, uh, within a few days of the lockdown, agriculture was called an essential service and was permitted. But I'd like to bring to light a detailed study of the various uh, guidelines issued by the Ministry of Home Affairs and by different state governments is that the central government was behind the times at every stage. Fisheries was not brought into essential activities for almost three weeks after the lockdown. So the Ministry of Home Affairs was not in touch with the Ministry of Agriculture or the ministries or the people who know what are all the activities that come under agriculture. And I think this is something that um, uh, is very important because it may be reflected in other parts of the economy as well, in other sectors, which I'm not uh, so aware of, but the state governments were much ahead of the center uh, in terms of recognizing cultural activities, the allied act, because these are perishable commodities, these are life commodities, which off for three months and then switched on again. And I think this is a big failure of planning uh, in terms of the lockdown in India. Thank you. 
thank you very much, Madhura. It's a very, very important point uh, in terms of uh, the issue of coordination, preparedness, and even actually knowledge of the sector and knowledge of the economy when you plunge an entire country like India with such diverse economies and such diverse producers, because no, sect no sector is homogenous, as you pointed out. Um, you know, to plunge an entire country into this kind of lockdown without adequate preparedness. So let's move on now to Ranjini Basu. Ranjini, the floor is yours. Um, so taking ahead this uh, conversation and uh, where uh, Madhura left it, um, at the point that uh, the impact of this COVID lockdown um, on agriculture, on the Indian countryside has been differential and differential even in terms of the region um, and rural classes. Um, in my presentation, I will be uh, mostly concentrating on rural workers, um, uh, the impact of rural workers. And firstly, I want to qualify why um, I'm focusing on rural workers rather than calling them agriculture workers, um, is how since 1991, um, due to the uh, neoliberal policies that have been adopted uh, in agriculture, there remains no pure um, agriculture labor uh, class as such. Um, the various village studies, including um, those done by uh, the FAS, uh, also shows uh, that there is um, uh, a class of manual workers uh, emerging. Uh, who have to do an assorted basket of agriculture and non-agriculture work uh, to maintain their uh, livelihoods. And this has been uh, due to the falling incomes from agriculture. Um, uh, also, these, these, these manual laborers actually can be called the footloose labor. Um, the, the short circular migrants that we see uh, who have been stranded in the cities coming from the villages uh, as a result of the great distress uh, that has pushed them um, more to the cities uh, is part of this labor force, workforce. Um, the census of India uh, provides us some, um, uh, uh, some, uh, some, some figures uh, for cultivators and agriculture laborers, uh, although this is not um, uh, 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 this is not complete because they miss out on certain sectors of agriculture such as plantation and livestock economy but still it gives us certain indicative trends as to what has been happening uh, to the working uh, population uh, in rural India. Uh, in between 2001 and 2011 censuses, we have seen that the agriculture laboring population has increased. Um, the percentage points have increased by their population has increased by 34%, whereas cultivator population uh, has decreased by about 7% in the same period. Uh, in 2011, we are talking about a population of about 144 million uh, agriculture uh, laborers as defined by the census. Uh, so we are talking about a huge population um, uh, of, um, uh, of, of, uh, of the rural um, economy uh, who are, uh, uh, although the agrarian workforce, the agrarian economy has, uh, has, has depressed, but um, the number of, uh, of, of worker population has increased in this period, and they have been the worst sufferers during this COVID pandemic. Um, uh, coming to the impact of the COVID on this population, one has to actually look at, start from the point of where uh, we uh, were uh, before the pandemic hit us. And um, as all of you know that uh, since the last few years, and especially last year, the demand crisis had heightened. Um, there was, it has been an extended period of stagnation and fall in demand, which is largely attributed um, uh, in the rural economy uh, to the wage stagnation, the wage declines and uh, stagnation and the decline in the employment available to the manual workers. Uh, the, the NSS, uh, consumption uh, report, the consumption data, which was not released uh, publicly, also shows that consumption had fallen from 2011 to 2017. Um, rural consumption had declined by 8%, 8.8%. Uh, the wage growth 
um, had declined um, from 14.6% uh, in 2014 to about 1%, 1.1% 1 .1 in 2019. So um, even before the pandemic hit, uh, this class of rural workers was suffering through um, huge loss of jobs, uh, unemployment, and which was impacting the demand uh, in the rural um, economy. And therefore, we understand that this agriculture season, uh, how important it was for them uh, to, uh, to, to uh, continue their livelihoods, to maintain their um, uh, live, livelihoods, actually. Um, also, uh, this pandemic has actually uh, come on the existing inequalities that um, uh, we have, uh, as um, uh, the moderator pointed out, and even Madhura uh, said in her presentation, um, that we have increasing landlessness, um, as, uh, the, the inequalities and in asset ownership um, have widened in this period of neoliberal reforms um, in the countryside. And uh, as also the data suggests that more people have lost lands and turned into um, agriculture work. Uh, the small and marginal cultivators also uh, have to do much more laboring out uh, work to maintain their uh, incomes, uh, marginal incomes. Uh, coming to the actual impact of uh, the pandemic on these rural um, classes, their employment. Um, as Madhura said, that uh, this was differential across um, the, the, the regions uh, because different regions were at different uh, times of the agriculture season. Um, this had a direct impact on the um, rural workers. Uh, for example, in Punjab and Haryana, uh, which had a ha which was a busy month of rabi harvest of um, wheat, and which largely depends on migrant workers from eastern states of Bihar, Jharkhand, um, there's an estimate that about one million workers, uh, rural um, uh, laborers, migrant laborers, move from Bihar to uh, Punjab during the Rabi season to uh, do, do the harvesting and the post harvest um, packaging and in the procurement set, uh, uh, the process in the procurement set centers. Um, these states suffered a, um, a labor supply shortage uh, as the workers could not move or went back to their home states. Uh, while in their home states, uh, like in Bihar, uh, because uh, of oversupply of labor, uh, there was a uh, there was a fall in wages uh, of these workers. Um, uh, the, 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 there is evidence from a, a Bihar village, Katkunya, that uh, the wages had depreciated by about rupees 50 uh, for uh, uh, both uh, men and women uh, uh, in the village. In the harvesting, uh, uh, in the harvesting processes, in the harvesting operations, um, uh, so we see a very differential uh, uh, suffering of the rural uh, laborers uh, in different parts during the COVID. Um, also, part of the um, uh, the migrant population uh, that I was talking about, uh, the people we have seen huge throngs of people moving from cities to their villages, walking down uh, those trans. Uh, uh, populations, uh, those also incre included the agriculture laborers. Um, uh, as you would all remember, the death of um, uh, the girl from Chhattisgarh, uh, Jamala, uh, has been one of the saddest uh, news and points of this lockdown, who was walking down from uh, Chhattisgarh uh, to Chhattisgarh from Telangana after, after um, uh, while she was stranded in Telangana uh, to do uh, chili harvest. So uh, the, 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 uh, also we have heard about the sugarcane um, uh, cutters uh, in Maharashtra uh, who had migrated from, uh, uh, from different districts uh, who continued work on the fields of, of sugar cutting uh, in very poor conditions until the trade unions actually intervened um, and uh, provided them some relief. Um, in terms of non-agriculture work, that is what uh, uh, the, the, the 
rural working population depends uh, in the lean season uh, wherever uh, there is no uh, agriculture operations happening we saw evidences that uh, non agriculture work has completely was completely stalled um, including nrega work uh, in the initial uh, time period of the lockdown uh, there was lack of clarity uh, whether it is outside the uh, rules and regulations of the lockdown so nrega work also completely stalled and once it uh, actually was brought um, uh, out of the restrictions still uh, the uh, the demand for work under nrega uh, uh, including the returning uh, migrants who went back to the villages demanded work were not provided uh, was not uh, uh, commensurated with the generation uh, of employment under the scheme and i think that is uh, because one of the reasons chief reasons for this is how nrega has been treated uh, in the last few years it has been left to relinquish of uh, suffered budget cuts um, and uh, the average days of uh, uh, work generated has been lower than the 100 days that is um, uh, that that uh, it uh, offers to rural households um, uh, the other point is that um, uh, uh, this condition of workers uh, both rural workers uh, is not specific just to india uh, we have observed this across the world um, uh, even in developing uh, developed countries western countries uh, us europe uh, the fao has been uh, has noted the essential kind of work that these um, rural workers uh, uh, do to continue agriculture production even during this pandemic um, and one of the uh, differences uh, lies is uh, lies between the developed countries and india um, in this matter is how corporate farming has also penetrated uh, which actually feeds on uh, the cheap um uh, uh, immigrant labor who are mostly unauthorized uh, for an uh, estimate for us uh, of the 2 million uh, farm workers that are estimated to be working on farms in the us about 50% are unauthorized uh, so that has also been um, a, a fallout of the agriculture pathways uh, of neoliberal agenda and more corporate um, driven agriculture that has been adopted in the western countries although that uh, uh, that that is not the reality of uh, india as of now uh, coming to my last uh, section of this first round of uh, presentation is about um the policies that are being offered to ameliorate the conditions of rural workers and uh, there is consensus about nrgs being the mode operandi uh, to uh, create employment and uh, generating demand in uh, rural india um, uh, which has after the uh, after the covid uh, has struck us although um, i would say that uh it is very inadequate as to um, uh, the the kind of uh, uh wages that have been proposed the, even after the increase in the wages it remains uh, abysmally low and uh, the 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 uh, the differences between the wages new newly revised wages of nrg and those uh, which are prevalent wages in agriculture and non agriculture work the data for which the uh, the labor bureau provides the data uh, we can see there is a huge gap uh, for example in uh, in punjab uh, the revised nrg rate is about 263 Uh, for 2020-21 uh, whereas the agriculture harvesting wages the for harvesting operations for men it is 353 and for women it is 354 so we see a huge difference even in non agriculture work the wages um, are 332 so uh, uh, the the revised wages are abysmally uh, still low uh, of what is needed by these rural households who are the poorest uh, and the most vulnerable uh, i lastly i would also like to point out that um, there has been uh, an increasing demand um especially from uh, states uh, which have suffered from labor shortages uh, 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 who have demanded that uh, agriculture work should be included into uh, nrega uh, the 
Punjab Chief Minister has already written to the center to grant that permission. Uh, however, uh, one has to remember that this is not a new demand of including uh, agriculture into NREGA, uh, especially in the uh, pre-sowing and post-harvest operations. Uh, in 2018, there was a subcommittee of chief ministers, subgroup of chief ministers, uh, group of chief ministers that was constituted to look into this matter. And uh, at that point too, the experts and various academics had pointed out how disastrous it can, it can uh, mean to the bargaining negotiating powers of the rural uh, rural labor force. Uh, therefore, uh, this pandemic should not uh, actually become a period of pushing for agendas and uh, reforms, uh, which are uh, which can go completely uh, against the laboring um, uh, classes. Uh, in uh, in Punjab, we already see uh, that there is growing tensions between uh, the landed classes and the uh, rural labor. Uh, there are reports coming in where the landowners um, have come together to uh, to keep the wages low and restrict movement of uh, rural uh, local rural labor. Uh, uh, so uh, so this shouldn't become an Punjab, uh, for that matter, is one of the is is the state uh, which has the most concentration of land. Uh, so this pandemic, or whatever way ahead, uh, shouldn't become uh, anti-labor, uh, anti-rural labor uh, stances have to be resisted. And as I was saying, that this pandemic has only accentuated the issues that were. That the, that the farmers, the uh, labor, rural labor, small farmers, marginal farmers were facing. And these have to be taken ahead as the real um, way forward. What has been already pointed out by movements even before the period of lockdown uh, in terms of access to rural infrastructure, uh, storage, um, market prices, uh, sorry, uh, crop prices, um, uh, issues of production, uh, uh, bringing down the cost of production, things like that remain and they have to be taken ahead along with the more structural issues of uh, disparities in asset ownership, uh, which has accentuated the gaps between different social groups as well as on lines of class, uh, caste and gender. So this has to be the way forward um, and nothing else. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Ranjini. So with that, I bring this to a close and I thank you all very much. Thank you for the participants. Very big, big thank you, of course, for the speakers. Uh, again, thank you for showing the complexities of the agricultural, rural agrarian sector, the relationship between cultivation, gathering and work, and uh, the relationship between what existed, what has been in our country for so many years, what's happening now and the ways forward. Thank <laughs> you.